Good afternoon. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Again, I'm Jennifer Walsh, Senior Media Officer with the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. Uh, this is a public briefing for the recently released report, The Health Effects of Cannabis and Cannabinoids, The Current State of Evidence and Recommendations for Research. You can download a, a copy of the report and other supporting materials right now, including today's PowerPoint slides uh, at www.nationalacademies.org forward slash cannabis health effects. You can also follow the conversation about the report on Twitter at hashtag cannabis health effects. For those of you not familiar with the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine, we are a private nonprofit institutions that provide independent objective analysis and advice to the U.S. to solve complex problems and inform public policy decisions related to science, technology, and medicine. The National Academies operate under a congressional charter to the National Academy of Sciences that was signed by President Lincoln in 1863. So for each requested study, panel members are chosen for their expertise and experience and serve pro bono to carry out the study statement of task. The reports that result from the study represent the consensus view of the committee, and it must undergo external peer review before they are released, as did this report. So for today's briefing, we'll start off with some opening remarks and a summary of the report, and then with the remaining time, several members of the committee that wrote the report will answer some questions you have. So please note that this briefing is scheduled to last for one hour unless uh, we run out of questions beforehand. Lastly, I just want to go over a few technical aspects of the webinar with you. So after the opening remarks, we'll begin to take questions through the Q&A box lo uh, located in the lower right-hand corner of your screen. Simply type in your question in the box at any time and click Submit. And we ask that you please leave the box set to your questions to all panelists. In addition, if you have any technical issues during the event, please contact WebEx Technical Support at 866-229-3239. Once again, that number is 866-229-3239. And with that, I would like to turn it over to Dr. Rose Mar uh, Marie Martinez the Senior Board Director for the Health and Medicine Division's Board on Population Health and Public Health Practice. Thank you, Jennifer. First, I'd like to thank the sponsors who gave us the opportunity to conduct this important work and the 16 members who gave extensively of their time and expertise to produce this report. We have five committee members with us to discuss the report's conclusions and recommendations, and I will introduce them now. Marie McCormick, Chair of the Committee, and, the professor, and Professor of Pediatrics at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Deva Cooper, Associate Professor of Clinical Neurobiology at Columbia University Medical Center. Sean Hennessy, Professor of Epidemiology, Systems Pharmacology, and Translational Therapeutics at the Perlman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania. Sachin Patel, Associate Professor and Director of the Division of Addiction Psychiatry at Vanderbilt University Medical Center, and Robert Wallace, Professor of Epidemiology and Internal Medicine at the University of Iowa College of Public Health. I would also like to thank the stalwart staff that supported the committee in conducting its work. Now I will turn uh, this briefing over to Dr. Lee Miles Jackson, the study director, to present the presentation. Thank you, Rose. For today's presentation, I'll start by giving a brief overview of the study context and statement of task. Um, the committee members will provide a brief overview of the study approach, uh, review the report highlights and recommendations, and I'll conclude with discussing some of the report products and upcoming events related to this, this project. As you may know, this is not the first marijuana-focused report released by the academies. In 1982, the report Marijuana and Health was released. This report analyzed the potential hazards and therapeutic value of marijuana use, assessed current federal research programs, identified new research directions, and drew conclusions to assist future policy decision making. In 1999, the report Marijuana and Medicine, Assessing the Science Base was released. This report offered several conclusions and recommendations on the effects of isolated cannabinoids, the efficacy of cannabinoid drugs, and the influence of psychological effects on therapeutic effects, among other important health topics. Although these reports were informative at the time, 
a lot has changed in the policy landscape of cannabis since the late 90s. Landmark changes in state-level policy have markedly uh, changed cannabis use patterns and perceived levels of risk. In addition, since 1999, there has been a marked increase in the potency of the cannabis product, as well as an expansion in the types of products available for use, such as edibles or oils. <coughs> it is important to note that unlike for other substances whose use may confer risk, such as alcohol or tobacco, there are currently no accepted standards for the safe use or appropriate doses available to help guide individuals as they make their choices regarding the issues of if, when, where, and how to use cannabis safely and in regard to therapeutic uses effectively. And a lack of definitive evidence has resulted in insufficient information on the health implications of cannabis use. So, in an effort to help better inform public health decisions, the sponsors of this report developed the following charge to the committee. In summary, the committee was asked to develop a comprehensive, in-depth review of existing evidence regarding the health effects, both harms and benefits, of cannabis and cannabinoid use make short and long-term recommendations regarding a research agenda to identify the most critical research questions and to advance the cannabis and cannabinoid research agenda. It should be noted here that the terms marijuana and cannabis are often used interchangeably, particularly within the United States. However, the committee considers them to be two separate entities. Cannabis is a broad term that can be used to describe organic products such as cannabinoids, marijuana, or hemp that are derived from species of the cannabis plant. So given its broad potential, the all-encompassing word cannabis has been adopted as a standard terminology within scientific and scholarly communities. And therefore, the committee uses the term cannabis rather than marijuana throughout this report. So the committee would like to thank the diverse group of project sponsors for their ongoing support of the study. And this, as you can see on the slide, is the listing of the current project sponsors. The current committee members are listed here, as well as here. <coughs> and with that, I'd like to turn things over to the chair, Dr. McCormick. Uh, I'd now like to start with the beginning of an overview of the study approach. <coughs> the committee formulated nearly 100 different research conclusions. For the sake of time, we will review selected highlights excuse me, from the chapters. <coughs> the committee members included expertise in substance abuse and some of the general health problems that we were addressing, as well as general epidemiology and public health. Between June and December 2016, the committee held five in-person meetings and one virtual meeting. <coughs> the committee also held two open sessions, providing an opportunity for public approach. <coughs> excuse me, public input. The, um, to address the study's charge, the committee conducted a comprehensive review of the current evidence related to the health effects of marijuana and of cannabis and can cannabinoid use. In their approach, the committee adopted key features of a systematic review process that is a comprehensive literature review, assessments by more than one person of the quality or risk of bias of key literature and conclusions free specification of questions of interest, and formulated standard language to allow comparisons between conclusions and declarations of conflict of interest. The committee conducted an extensive review of relevant databases using multiple terms. The initial search resulted in 24,000 articles that had the potential to be relevant to the study's charge. In the committee's approach, they were asked to focus on questions and consequences with the potential for the greatest public health impact. Therefore, using specific research restrictions and identifying prioritized research questions, the committee narrowed down the literature results to more than 10,000 abstracts to determine their potential for the report. Given this large scientific base on cannabis, the breadth of the statement of tasks and the time constraints, the committee developed an approach that resulted in giving primacy to recently published systematic reviews, and by recently mean from 2011 to August 2016, and high quality primary research generally from 1999 to last report to August 2016. That study, and then studied one or more of the committee's 11 prioritized health points. <coughs> Excuse me. 
The committee is aware that in using this approach, there's a possibility that some literature may have been missed. And therefore, certain high, and moreover, certain high quality studies may not have been reviewed in this report because it did not address the specific endpoints in question. It also means that there may have been quite uh, relevant research published after August 2016, which we were not seeing. The 11 prioritized health areas were seen in the next slide. Uh, they included the therapeutic effects and, uh, and, and effects on and, <clears throat> and, and risk factors for various uh, conditions seen above. Um, informed, informed by the reports of previous IOM committees, the committee developed standard language to categorize the weight of the evidence regarding whether cannabis or cannabinoid use for therapeutic purposes are an effective or ineffective treatment and for the prioritized health points of interest, whether cannabis or cannabinoid use primarily for recreational purposes was associated with risk for the prioritized outcome. And you can see all of this in our report. There were some special study considerations. The first is biological plausibility. The committee chose not to review basic non-human research in order to attempt to bolster evidence for identified health outcomes for cannabis exposure. Instead, the committee focused its efforts on identifying high-quality studies with best information and the lowest risk of bias as a way to ensure that the report findings and conclusions were as informative as relevant as possible. There was also the issue of synthesis of observational studies, and these presented some challenges arising in part from the greater <coughs> variety in study design, and we used explicit criteria for examining these and the limitations of exposure. And finally, this report was not designed to reconcile the proposed harms and benefits of cannabis or cannabinoid use across the report's chapter. We'll now turn to John Hennessy to review uh, the therapeutics. Thank you. So the committee found uh, three indications for which there was either substantial or conclusive evidence for the efficacy of either cannabis itself, cannabis-based uh, products, or synthetic uh, cannabinoids. Uh, the first of those is um, nausea and vomiting associated with cancer chemotherapy. Uh, that is um, an FDA-approved indication uh, for two synthetic uh, cannabinoids. Uh, further, in adults with uh, chronic pain and in uh, persons with uh, muscle spasms associated with multiple sclerosis, um, there is uh, good quality evidence that uh, some patients obtain uh, substantial relief um, based uh, from either cannabis or cannabis-based products. Uh, for the other conditions uh, that we examined, um, there was either um, limited uh, no or insufficient evidence uh, either for or against uh, a therapeutic effect. I'd now like to move to um, potential adverse effects of cannabis, starting with uh, respiratory disease. Um, so the committee found uh, that there was substantial evidence that uh, long-term smoking of cannabis results in uh, worse respiratory symptoms, including uh, an increase in the frequency of episodes of chronic bronchitis. Uh, there are a couple of uh, physiologic measures uh, of lung function that are uh, affected by uh, long-term cannabis smoking, uh, although the clinical importance of those physiologic metrics um, is uh, unknown. Um, there's also moderate evidence that stopping smoking of cannabis results in improvements in uh, some of the uh, respiratory problems, including chronic bronchitis uh, that I mentioned above. Uh, there was really limited evidence of associations between uh, cannabis smoking and onset of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and of uh, onset of asthma and asthma exacerbations. Uh, now for uh, the discussion on uh, injury, I'll uh, turn the presentation over to Bob Wallace. So good afternoon. Uh, let me start with uh, issues related to uh, injury and overall mortality. Uh, we 
we did find that uh, ca cannabis use prior to driving increases the risk of being involved in a motor vehicle accident. Uh, with regard to uh, children in states where cannabis use is legal, there has been an increased risk of unintentional cannabis overdose uh, injuries, and uh, uh, the, the evidence for that was moderate. Uh, with regard to all-cause mortality, that is general causes of death, we found uh, insufficient evidence, unclear and insufficient evidence that uh, uh, the recreational cannabis smoking was associated with all-cause mortality uh, or, in fact, with occupational injury. Uh, let me turn next to the cancer issue. Uh, there was moderate evidence of no statistical association between cannabis smoking and the incidence of lung cancer, and that was also true of uh, another smoking-related, uh, tobacco smoking-related uh, set of tumors, and that is head and neck cancers. Uh, there was uh, limited evidence of, an, of, of a positive association between current, frequent, and chronic cannabis smoking and one particular type of uh, testicular cancer. Uh, on the next slide, we list a, a, a number of uh, cancer site, other cancer sites uh, where there generally have been few or single studies, and, and in, all, in all these instances, there was insufficient evidence to support or refute uh, an association, and that included esophageal cancer. Uh, and in the second bullet, you can see a number of cancers, including uh, prostate, cervical, uh, brain tumors, Hodgkin's lymphoma, penile cancer, anal cancer, and uh, uh, other, uh, other tumors. And then finally, uh, there have been mostly single studies that have looked at whether uh, maternal use of cannabis during, uh, uh, during pregnancy leads to cancer in the offspring. And again, there are single studies uh, that have that have suggested an association uh, for the variety of tumors that you can read in the third bullet, and uh, we found insufficient evidence for uh, uh, for all of these associations. So I'd like to, I, I wanted to finally uh, talk about uh, uh, cardiometabolic risk, and we found uh, uh, limited and unclear evidence about the association between cannabis use and heart attack, stroke, and diabetes. So now I'd like to turn it over uh, back to uh, uh, Professor McCormick to talk about some of the other issues. When we looked at the literature on the effects of cannabis or cannabinoids on immunity, we found that there was a paucity of data on the effects of cannabis or, or other substances on the human immune system. In essence, there's insufficient data to draw overarching conclusions concerning the effects of cannabis smoke or cannabinoids on immune competence. Um, there is some evidence to suggest that there may be limited anti-inflammatory activity, and there's insufficient evidence to support or refute a connection between cannabis or cannabinoid use and the effects on the immune status in individuals with HIV. Turning to prenatal, perinatal, and neonatal outcomes, uh, we found strong evidence that smoking cannabis during pregnancy is linked to lower birth weights in infants. However, the relationship between smoking cannabis during pregnancy and other pregnancy and childhood outcomes is unclear. Uh, and I'd like to turn over to Sashin Patel to talk about the psychosocial. Thank you. <clears throat> so w with regard to cannabis use and psychosocial outcomes, the main findings were that recent cannabis use uh, was found to impair performance in cognitive domains of learning, memory, and attention, with recent use being defined as use within the past 24 hours of evaluation. Uh, in addition, a limited, numbers of, a limited number of studies suggest that there are impairments in cognitive domains of learning and memory and attention in individuals who have stopped smoking cannabis. And lastly, that cannabis use during adolescence is related to impairment in subsequent academic achievement, education, employment and income, and social relationships and social roles. 
Uh, turning now to mental, mental health outcomes, uh, we found that there was substantial evidence for a statistical association between cannabis <coughs> use and the development of schizophrenia and other psychotic disorders, with highest risk being associated with the most frequent cannabis use. Uh, in individuals with schizophrenia and other psychotic disorders, a history of cannabis use may be linked to better performance on measures of learning and memory tasks. Uh, in addition, cannabis use does not appear to increase the likelihood of developing depression, anxiety disorders, or post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, for individuals diagnosed with bipolar disorder, nearly daily use may be linked to greater symptoms of bipolar disorder relative to non-cannabis users. In addition, heavy cannabis users are more likely to report thoughts of suicide than non-cannabis users. Uh, lastly, regular cannabis is likely to increase the risk of developing a specific type of anxiety disorder and a social anxiety disorder. Those highlight the mental health outcomes uh, with the strongest evidence. And I'm going to turn it over to Ziva Cooper for a discussion of problematic cannabis use. So we looked at um, different variables that might be associated with developing problem cannabis use or cannabis use disorder, and we found that greater frequency of cannabis use um, increases the likelihood of developing problem cannabis use. We also found substantial, substantial evidence supporting that initiating cannabis use at a younger age increases the likelihood of developing problematic cannabis use later in life. Um, we were also interested in understanding the effects of cannabis use on abuse of other substances. And what we found there was that there is limited evidence of a statistical association between cannabis use and the initiation of tobacco use. Furthermore, we found that there's also limited evidence of a statistical association between cannabis use and changes in the rates and use patterns of other illicit and illicit substances. However, we found um, moderate evidence of a statistical association between cannabis use and the development of substance dependence and or a substance abuse disorder for substances including alcohol, tobacco, and other illicit drugs. And now I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Wallace to talk about barriers of cannabis research. Okay. Um, in addition to the health outcomes, we heard from uh, many investigators about the barriers of, uh, of uh, doing cannabis research, and uh, we've listed uh, some of them on the slide that, uh, that you have. Some of these barriers are regulatory in that uh, uh, cannabis is a Schedule I substance that is listed as the most, most severe uh, uh, substance, most uh, uh, toxic and dangerous, and so uh, uh, it, it raises uh, administrative issues about uh, access to, uh, uh, to a suitable amount of uh, quality and quantity of cannabis product uh, for doing research. And uh, uh, again, we heard that from uh, uh, several people. Uh, an additional problem is availability of funding for uh, uh, cannabis research, given particularly that there that we identified across the board a number of uh, unanswered questions, and we recommended a diverse network of funders that included uh, federal and uh, state and local and private uh, uh, entities to uh, help in this uh, activity. And then finally, a, more of a methodologic issue, uh, we thought that there was a, a, a general problem of being able to identify the extent of exposure to cannabis in both populations and individuals, and we are hoping for a more standardized approach to uh, various ways of assessing how much uh, and over what time period of cannabis is being used by in the community. So turning, this is Dr. McCormick again, turning to the report recommendation based on these research findings and conclusions, clearly the first one is to address the research gaps and to develop a comprehensive base on the short-term and long-term health effects of cannabis use, both beneficial and harmful, 
a variety of, pub of funders are needed, both public agencies, philanthropic and professional organizations, private companies, and clinical and public health research groups. And they should, find, should provide funding across a broad range of topics that look at both the clinical and observational research, health policy and health economics research, and the public health and public health, health safety. The second recommendation is that, as mentioned by Dr. Wallace, we need to improve the research quality. And to promote the development of conclusive evidence on the short and long-term health effects of cannabis use, particularly agents of the United States Department of Health and Human Services, particularly NIH and CDC, should jointly fund a workshop to develop a set of research standards and benchmarks to guide and ensure the production of high-quality, comparable cannabis research. In addition, given the fast-pacing uh, change in terms of both the products that are available as well as its accessibility, there is a need to improve surveillance capacity. And to ensure that sufficient data are available to inform this, again, uh, a group of people, including the CDC, it's SAMHSA, and the state and uh, county health officers, as well as state and local public health departments, should fund and support improvements to federal health, public health surveillance systems, and state-based public health surveillance efforts. And finally, recommendation four, uh, to address the research barriers, the CDC, uh, NIH, FDA, and other industry groups should combine, combine a command panel of experts to produce an objective and evidence-based report that fully characterizes the impact of regulatory barriers to cannabis research and that proposes strategies for supporting the development of the resources and infrastructure necessary to conduct a comprehensive cannabis agenda. And I turn it back to Lee. Thank you, Marie. Okay, and so I just want to conclude this part of the presentation with um, identifying some of the report products and upcoming events. Um, on our website right now, which I believe you can find at nationalacademies.org slash cannabis health effects, uh, you'll find some of our products, which is uh, a report highlights, which is about a four-page report brief, which kind of summarizes the, the report um, in, in, into a, a more digestible format. Um, we also have report conclusions, which is a consolidated listing of the conclusions. Uh, we have the chapter highlights, which gives also a consolidated listing of some of the key um, highlights from each chapter that will hopefully strike your interest and um, motivate you to, to read the research below. Um, and also we'll have two upcoming PowerPoint slide sets that we can use for uh, professionals or policymakers, but that's um, not currently up there and still being developed. Um, in February 2017, so next month, the committee will host a stakeholder engagement meeting, um, and that meeting is going to be open to the public, but also webcasted. And we'll have representatives of the committee, like we do today, that will discuss the report's finding to a professional audience. And the committee will engage in panel discussions with stakeholders of the report, and they will also field questions from the general public. So that's something to look forward to. Um, if you go to our website, I think there might be an opportunity to join our listserv in case you're interested in staying updated with those events. Um, and with that, I'd like to thank you for your support of this important study and um, for following the presentation today. And I think now we'll take questions, Jennifer. Yeah, there's been a couple of questions just coming in uh, throughout the, the presentation. Again, you can ask questions by typing into the Q&A box on the left-hand side of your screen. Um, Folks asked for the hashtag again, and that is hashtag cannabis health effects. And again, the PowerPoint slides from today's presentation will be posted on that link uh, up on top later on this afternoon. Um, so our first question uh, comes from Malcolm Ritter, who I believe is with the Associated Press. He asks, your report concludes that the lack of scientific information on cannabis and cannabinoids constitutes a public health risk, right? Can you please expand upon that? Well, I think this is Marie McCormick. I think to begin with, and I hope my, my fellow members will chime in, if you're talking about individuals who are trying to consider uh, the use of cannabinoids in terms of recreational cannabinoids, there's very little to guide them as to what would be an appropriate amount or not appropriate amount and what the health risks are, 
not only just the smoking uh, cannabinoid products, but also for the other kinds of modes of administration for which we could find virtually no information. So there's widespread accessibility in the population, uh, but there's very little information to guide either individuals or professionals about what constitutes the risks and who should or should not uh, be using uh, cannabinoid products. I think we can safely say, however, that adolescents should not be using these products because of their susceptibility to addiction of any other kinds of substances. But uh, beyond much of that, there's very little information in terms of particularly some of the risks like pulmonary risk, cardiovascular risk that are totally unknown. And I hope someone else will chime in. Maybe the mental health risk? Um, sure. So, I mean, one of the, as I mentioned earlier, uh, uh, this is Sachin Patel again, um, one of the conclusions with the most evidence uh, suggested that cannabis use uh, increases the risk for psychotic disorders, including schizophrenia. However, there are many unanswered questions still uh, about that, specifically around uh, determining, uh, determining uh, causality between cannabis use and, uh, and schizophrenia. So again, the absence of information um, puts us in a position where we have a large number of people using these products without a clear idea of the long-term health consequences. And Bob, I'll put you on the spot with your occupational, <laughs> among yeah. others. Uh, sure. So, so there are risks in many directions uh, for not having enough information. Uh, one uh, related to occupational injuries is that uh, right now, there's a lot of screening for uh, substance use, including uh, cannabis, and uh, I think it's really important to know what the risks are and not to uh, uh, waste uh, health screening on uh, health screening resources in, in areas where they may or may not be useful. Um, I think also uh, in those instances where uh, therapeutically where uh, uh, cannabis has been used, shown to be effective, uh, at least to some extent, in uh, symptom alleviation. Uh, uh, it's uh, people are at risk if the word doesn't get out and the drug isn't accessible, and uh, uh, it, it can take its place in the armamentarium. So there's lots of missing information in lots of areas. Um, and then finally, we just dealt with a lot of conditions like cardiovascular disease and cancers where there just simply isn't enough information. and We need to know that so that the better control practices can be uh, invoked. This is Sean Hensley. I'd, I'd add to that that there's um, substantial use of cannabis for conditions for which it may or may not be effective. We simply don't have uh, the data to know. So um, developing those data to, uh, to inform patients and um, medical practitioners, um, it should be a high priority. Thank you. Our next question asks, the report finds conclusive or substantial evidence that whole plant cannabis possesses efficacy for some forms of chronic pain. Based on this determination, is it your belief that cannabis should be rescheduled under federal law? So uh, this is Sean Hennessy. Um, recommendations for uh, Regulatory changes, such as uh, changing the, the scheduling of, of cannabis, are, are simply beyond uh, the mandate uh, of our committee and, and are not addressed in our report. Okay, our next question is: What um, what did you guys qualify as short or long term use? John Hennessy again. Um, uh, in general, most of the uh, short term studies for therapeutic use. Uh, we're in the four to six week range. Um, studies of long-term use tended to be for um, adverse effects uh, of cannabis. Um, my recollection is those tended to be um, several months or longer. This is Marie. We actually looked at at least some studies for perinatal use uh, where we where the the individuals in the studies have been followed up for 20 years from their exposure. So it varied with the study. Thank you. Our next question is, uh, how are you distinguishing between whole plant cannabis and individual cannabinoids for the therapeutic benefits you mentioned, such as like nausea, MS, and pain? 
All right, so this is Sean Hennessy again. So the um, the report, um, when when speaking about different therapeutic in indications, um, makes reference to the particular products that were studied, uh, at least in general terms. Um, and of course, uh, there's a reference list um, that shows the either the systematic reviews or the individual papers um, that state which particular um, products were evaluated in which particular study. So the, um, the report uh, provides a summary of that information and, and more detailed information is uh, available in the papers cited in the references section. Okay, our next question is, can you talk about what is the difference in your definitions between cannabis and cannabinoids in the review? Uh, so this is Sean Hennessy, I'll, I'll take that again. So um, cannabis is, uh, is the plant. Um, products derived from the plant would be considered cannabis-based products, and the um, individual molecules that are um, either present in cannabis or are related to the compounds that are present in cannabis would be referred to as cannabinoids, whether they are naturally derived or synthetic. Thank you. Uh, our next question is, uh, are the results of this report based on controlled trial studies? So, this is Sean Hennessy, I, I can take that again. So, um, for the therapeutics chapter, chapter four, um, almost all of the studies, so the, the studies that we were able to form uh, strong conclusions on uh, were based on uh, randomized um, controlled trials. Um, and in, um, in the sections where we examined uh, non-therapeutic use of cannabis, uh, most of those studies were non-experimental, observational, um, uh, follow-up studies. This is Marie. Although some of those studies may have included groups who used cannabis who did not use cannabis or who used other substances, so there was some attempt to par parse that out. But they are uh, observational studies, and individuals were not randomized to their, their condition, i.e. using cannabis or not. Uh, with regard, our next question is, with regard to mental health issues and problematic use, is there any evidence of a of causational relationship? Um, so this is Diva Cooper, and um, our conclusions are based on associations between cannabis and mental health outcomes um, and, can and problematic cannabis use. So we do not make any um, causal statements um, or causal conclusions. There are associations. Thank you. Our next question. Um, are there any concerns that the results of the study may provide marijuana enthusiasts uh, permission to use cannabis on a frequent basis? So this is Sean Hennessy. I, I can try to feel that. So, you know, we were asked to summarize and synthesis, summarize and synthesize the evidence uh, for beneficial and adverse effects of cannabis. So uh, we tried our best to provide objective answers, um, and people will use that information however they use that information. Thank you. Um, our next question is, how do researchers propose to include and use all the different chemical profiles from all the different strains in the ter determination of what cannabinoids, cannabinoids are effective for which diseases? Um, so this is Eva Cooper, and um, we didn't we didn't have any uh, research to go on for for these specific questions. So the cannabinoids that were primarily looked at in the therapeutic effects were um, THC and cannabidiol. Um, with regard to looking at the other cannabinoids that are present in the cannabis plant, so there are over 110 identified cannabinoids. And um, it will take rigorous controlled study to look at some of the prevalent cannabinoids that are found in the cannabis plant in, or, in order to determine their therapeutic efficacy for certain indications. But we don't have information on that as of now. 
So, someone asked our next question is, can you explain the difference between uh, what you mean by limited and moderate evidence in the report? <clears throat> Hi, this is Marie McCormick again. Um, basically, this is uh, an examination of the literature that was available for each question, which included the number of studies, uh, the findings of those studies, the findings of whether those studies are actually uh, moving in the same direction, and, and also the size of the effect, that is, uh, how much those who have been exposed to cannabis differ from those who have not. Um, <clears throat> for the level of moderate evidence, uh, there should be several supportive findings from good to fair quality studies, and we would say that good to fair was rated on an objective rating scheme that we used, with very few or no credible opposing findings. The general conclusion may be made, but limitations always include things like chance, bias, and confounding that cannot be ruled out. Limited evidence, on the other hand, is that there are some supportive findings uh, from fair quality studies or mixed findings, most of which favor one conclusion or another. The conclusion can be made, but again, there's almost incre there is certainly uncertainty and increased uncertainty due to the fact that we can't control for some of the confounding factors. Thank you. Our next question is, does the report distinguish between whole plant cannabis, which contains hundreds of compounds, and individual cannab cannabinoids? And if not, how did the study account for the near impossibility of dosing and standardizing of complex botanical products? Uh, so this is Sean Hennessy again. Um, so for uh, looking at the therapeutic effects of um, medicinal cannabis, um, most of the products that were studied were um, oral extracts uh, of cannabis that had measured amounts of THC and or CBD. Um, so for uh, most of the studies, uh, the dose that was given is known. So clearly for the studies that examined uh, smoked whole cannabis, um, those determinations uh, mostly weren't made. Um, so it's uh, more difficult to generalize the results from one study to other settings where um, where the, the nature of the whole plant cannabis may vary. This is Marie McCormick again. This is, uh, in fact, a problem that's compounded in the observational studies because the observational studies that we're talking about uh, occurred over a 20-year period over which the changes in the content and the, the potency of marijuana has increased. Uh, I will simply say that almost all of the studies we looked at, with the exception of the therapeutic studies, involves smoking, uh, cannabis. There are no studies that we could find on the current administration, such as dapping or vaping or oils or edibles. Uh, and so the issue of the content and just, you know, trying to disentangle what the, the uh, actual dose received uh, was even compounded further in the uh, observational studies. Uh, this is why we make the recommendation that there needs to be a, uh, a workshop that sets up standards by which this research can be done so that we can compare across studies and across time. Thank you. Our next question is, should people be cautious when interpreting some of these results and the possibility that they reflect correlation and not causation? Okay. Uh, sure, this is uh, Sanjay Patel again. I think as, as was mentioned earlier in regard to uh, other uh, endpoints, um, for the vast majority of the conclusions in the report, we are reporting on the strength of evidence of an association between cannabis use and a particular health outcome. Uh, in some cases, we discuss possible reasons for the association, uh, but uh, in the vast majority of cases, those um, statistical associations are, are just that associational and not, not causal. Thank you. Our next question, uh, when the committee concludes moderate evidence for marijuana is linked to other drugs, uh, what are other drugs meant to be defined as? Cocaine, heroin, anything else? So this is Eva Cooper um, speaking, and the truth is, is that when we talk about um, it's linked to uh, develop, development of substance use disorders of illicit substances, um, we don't know the data on, uh, on separate drugs, so cocaine, opiates, or amphetamines um, or other drugs, they are kind of, they're lumped together. 
Thank you. Uh, does the committee have any recommendations on whether cannabis should be re- or descheduled in order to influence research? This is Dr. McCormick again. This again was a question that was outside the scope uh, of the committee's uh, purview and tasks. However, we hope that the uh, information that's provided in it will provide a basis for consideration of what should be done in terms of uh, classifying um, cannabis, and also we do recommend that a, uh, another committee be formed to actually identify what is the objective and evidence base for the kind of scheduling that should be done. Thank you. Our next question is, how do you suggest more and better studies be done with the current Schedule One restric restrictions, as well as the questionable quality of the legal supply from the government grow facilities? And who's going to donate funds for an illegal product? Um, so this is Eva Cooper, and one of the recommendations that we make is for um, a diverse network of organizations to fund uh, future research on cannabis, both as potential therapeutic effects and adverse, adverse health effects. Um, and with regards to the uh, scheduling and the access, um, uh, we we make a recommendation that a committee be convened to talk about how to best address these, these um, hurdles and barriers for future cannabis research. This is Marie McCormick again. I would note that it's not illegal in all jurisdictions and that some of the states have actually planned to, do, to have funds for examining some of these issues. So it, again, it's this diversity of funders and diversity of settings that's needed to address this issue. Thank you. Our next question is, is there any evidence on the use of cannabis during pregnancy and birth defects? Um, there's very, very limited evidence on that. This is Marie McCormick. Um, we did examine that issue. Um, and uh, basically, uh, the main systematic review that was uh, referred to in the text, there was no estimate provided. There were some primary literature uh, that we reviewed that showed no difference. There were a couple of case control studies that did show uh, some increased risk for a variety of uh, malformations, but these are indeed single, single studies, uh, and again, this issue needs to be addressed uh, more systematically. Our next question, uh, uh, did any of the studies take into account the human genetic factor? That is, were any of the studies looking at the endocannabinoid system genetics in the users, as each person's endocannabinoid system may influence the outcomes measured. So this is Sean Hennessek. I speak to the therapeutic studies. So, uh, none of the therapeutic studies that we looked at um, had genetic information. And this is Marie again, not, nor did the observational studies. Uh, Tasha Patel, there were uh, a few studies within the mental health section specifically related to schizophrenia, for example, on page 12.5 covers a few of them. However, none of those were looking at genetic, genetic factors um, within the endocannabinoid signaling system in itself. Um, so the answer to that would be no, but um, some other uh, genetic moderating factors are discussed uh, in, the, in the mental health chapter. And this is Eva Cooper. With regards to looking at variables that might affect development of cannabis use disorder, we did not include studies that um, looked at uh, uh, genotype. Uh, thank you. Our next question of the uh, nearly 100 conclusions that the committee uh, reached, what, which ones had the strongest evidence? Your turn. Um, so the findings that had the strongest evidence include um, the fact that initiating cannabis use at a young age is a risk factor for developing problematic cannabis use. Um, and also that pregnant women who smoke cannabis uh, increase the risk that their baby will be born with a lower birth weight, and longer-term cannabis smoking is, uh, presents an increased risk for chronic breathing problems. Um, and as uh, Dr. Hennessy pointed out, um, there is uh, conclusive or substantial evidence demonstrating that some people with chronic pain 
muscle spasms from multiple sclerosis or nausea and vomiting from cancer chemotherapy obtain some relief of their, ther of their symptoms from using cannabis-based products or cannabis. So those are the, um, some of the strongest conclusions that we made. Thank you. Our next question, uh, can the committee talk more about specific regulatory or administrative barriers to scientific research that you're refer referring to? Um, they've heard many generalizations, but nothing particular on the issue. This is Marie McCormick. That was not our um, particular uh, focus of, of the scope of the work. Uh, we certainly heard from investigators and from the lead agencies uh, about some of the issues that were involved, but we did not do a systematic review of the regulatory barriers to doing this work. Thank you. Our next question, uh, did you consider any animal studies of any kind? Um, this is Marie McCormick again. We did not. That was, in fact, an explicit exclusion criteria for the studies that we examined. Uh, can you talk? Uh, thank you. Our next question is: What type of private organizations do the committee uh, does the committee anticipate will be interested in funding cannabis research, and why? So this is Sean Hennessy. So hopefully, uh, both um, the federal government and different agencies within the federal government and state governments um, have a big stake in um, increasing uh, the available knowledge um, about the adverse and beneficial effects of cannabis. So, so hopefully both the federal and state governments will step up. In addition, there are uh, private foundations uh, that fund research that uh, we are hopeful uh, will uh, increase um, the support for cannabis-based research. Thank you. Our next question, was there a reason that the distinction in effects between cannabis containing primarily THC and cannabis containing THC and CBD was not addressed by the committee? So this is Sean Hennessy. Um, so in, um, in the chapter where we uh, discuss the evidence for the therapeutic benefit of cannabis, um, we summarize um, what products were studied, and we uh, cite the uh, systematic reviews and individual uh, research papers. Um, so that, that that information is freely available, and, and we provide a summary of it. Um, we then it um, we then provide a, a detailed uh, evaluation of that. Thank you. Our next question: About what age uh, of starting using cannabis? Starting using cannabis correlated to later problematic use. Um, so this is Eva Cooper, and we didn't find a specific age. We just we looked at um, adolescent onset of use. Uh, so different different um, findings from different from the primary literature used a different age from which they began following that cohort. So we do not have a specific age where uh, we see increased vulnerability. It's um, childhood and adolescence. It's a critical period for um, neurodevelopment um, that, that could lead to increased adverse effects of, of cannabis. Thank you. Our next question, did you find any of the results of the report to be particularly surprising or unexpected? This is Marie McCormick. Uh, I think that the committee went into the, the process, regardless of their expertise and their areas of interest, with an open mind. That is, they came in uh, willing to be guided by the evidence as they saw it. And so in terms of thinking about surprises or thinking about um, uh, deeply held beliefs or myths or whatever, I don't think the committee uh, had that kind of reaction. I think what impressed the committee is something that I think you're hearing fairly regularly is the lack of information to address many of the questions that we had in our, our report. And so it was that uh, lack of information that I think was most impressive. Thank you. Our, our next question, is there any information on the percentage cannabis use, disor use disorder and ramifications among users, both recreational and medical? 
Um, so this is Eva Cooper. This is uh, where there's absence of data. Uh, we don't. There's not. There's not literature following people that are using medical cannabis and rates of developing cannabis use disorder. Um, and with regards to non-medical use of cannabis, um, we know that uh, rates of developing cannabis use disorder among adolescents is higher than those who start in adulthood. Thank you. Our next question, uh, can the committee talk a little bit about how the information bank has changed since the 1982 report? So this is Sean Hennessy. I, I can address that. Um, so there's been a, a lot of research, both in terms of uh, looking at potential adverse effects and looking at potential beneficial effects um, that can be seen in just the, the sheer uh, volume of uh, papers that we looked at. Um, you know, the, the products that people are using um, has changed, the extent of use uh, has gone up uh, and will continue to go up. Uh, so the opportunities to study it have been there and will continue to expand. Thank you. Our next question. Uh, the committee uh, appeared to have covered a lot of scientific abstracts. Can you talk a little bit about how you examine so much literature? This is Marie McCormick again. As I mentioned, uh, we had some preset um, criteria by which we looked at the literature. Uh, one is that we identified 11 content areas for which we were going to look at literature. Uh, I've also mentioned that uh, we eliminated animal studies uh, in doing that. We limited the time over which we looked at this literature, which is from uh, 1999 to August 2016 for the primary literature and 2011 to August 2016 for systematic reviews. So when you look at 10,000 abstracts, it sounds like an overwhelming job, and it certainly was an arduous job. But when you begin to put some of these criteria in place to eliminate the animal studies, to eliminate the basic science studies, it becomes much more feasible. And then looking at the abstracts, you can look at the research design, you can look at the numbers, and you can determine pretty quickly what studies might have um, reasonable results. At that point, we full, pulled the full paper to review to see if it was actually uh, borne out by what the results said in the paper. So uh, a lot of this went through in terms of looking at the, the, the abstracts and seeing to what extent it was relevant. And many, even though they came up through the search terms, uh, were not relevant to the report. Thank you. And that actually brings us close to the top of the hour, so that concludes today's webinar. Again, thank you all uh, for joining us. You can get a copy of the report now, uh, the slides later on this afternoon at nationalacademies.org forward slash cannabis health effects. Uh, we will just have the PowerPoint slides up, not the web in, uh, WebEx. And uh, thank you all again, hashtag cannabis health effects. We did have uh, dozens of questions come in, so I apologize if we did not get to everybody's questions. Uh, we had a huge turnout, so thank you all for joining.